this is Harriet Grayson, your host and producer for Community Culture Showcase. So it's summertime, and in summer, one of the wonderful things we do is have lots and lots of art. Art shows, art festivals, all kinds of artists come out of their hibernation to give us and show us their wonderful, wonderful work. So I'm really happy today. I have with me one of the artists that has been here before and actually has displayed her beautiful art in our studio. We hope to have an art show again in September, and of course, we want all the audiences to come on by and see what great art is being produced here. And also I have with me a guest who has a slightly different uh, artistic bent, and that is through her husband. She produ they produce some beautiful jewelry, and the jewelry is like artwork. So it is a, a wonderful thing to see how jewelry can be used not only in traditional things like rings and necklaces, but a, a lot of other interesting things. So we're going to talk to them both today. So let me welcome Beth. Welcome to the show, welcome to here, welcome to the studio. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, for someone who might not have seen our show before, and a little bit about the kind of art that you actually like. Okay, well, I'm a pastel painter. Okay. And I like art that is colorful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for folks who aren't that familiar, I would say impressionists, uh, expressionist, fauvist, if they know any of those kinds of paintings. Right. Very colorful, very loose, a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. um, not especially realistic. Okay. All you right. know, we all have cameras. Yes, yes. You yes. don't need me to do what your camera can do. Right. So my art is more about how it felt to be there. Mm -hmm. And I want to show people whatever it was that made me stop in my tracks and go, wow, right. I want to share that. Uh, so, and the medium that I use to do that is pastel, right. soft pastels, which are basically pure sticks of color. They're just intensely colored pigments ground up with just a little bit of binder to hold them together. Okay. And you paint with that stick, without a brush, without mm -hmm. turpentine, without anything else to interfere between me and the color. Right. Which is why I love them. Okay. And so that's what I do is pastel painting. And Have you always done pastel? I've done it for the last couple of decades. Okay. I started out using many other traditional media. Right. Um, oils and acrylics and faux finish work and colored pencils and pottery and jewelry, you name it, um, interior decorating. If oh. there was something that involved playing with shapes and color, mm -hmm. I tried it. Okay, um, all right. But pastel turns out to be the thing that really works well for me because the colors are intense, mm -hmm. the medium is pretty forgiving, I can go over something if I don't like it, I can change it pretty easily. Um, I don't have to wait for it to dry. Mm -hmm. If I have an idea, I can just try it. Right. If I have a different idea, I can try that right over it. Right. A lot of other painting media require you to wait. Okay. Not my strong suit. Uh -huh. so. <laughs> no, no patience as an artist. And the canvas is the same canvas one would use with oil or acrylic? No, it, no. it isn't actually. I don't usually work on canvas. I work on either a textured paper Okay. or a, a prepared board that has texture to it. Because the thing with pastels is that you want to lay them over each other and have the texture show. Mm -hmm. Because the, those little bits of pigment catch the light. And they're, those fragments refract the light. And it makes the whole thing sort of glow more. I see. OK. And that's the beauty of that medium. And so you use either a very textured paper so that you can sometimes fill in the holes with one color and then kind of glance over it with another color and mm. you see the layering mm -hmm. and sometimes you see the texture and sometimes I'll leave it that way because I'm painting something that has texture like mm -hmm. a cobblestone street maybe. Right, you know? right, right. Um, or a tree or tree or bark. Or a tree yes. bark, exactly right. Or the, the dappling on the leaves and then the sunlight and the sky behind it. So sometimes I'll use the texture mm -hmm. and I won't fill it in on purpose. Other times I will fill it in um, and you do that also to show if something's forward or backwards in a painting or in the background or closer to you. And sometimes you actually fill up the paper, which point a lot of people will spray in order to create a new surface to which the pastel will then adhere again. Oh, okay. I don't do that okay. because it also darkens the painting when you spray. Oh. And that's the last thing I want to do because I'm trying to show the energy and the lightness and the brightness and the color. So I will I'll literally I'll turn it upside down and bang the back of it and any loose dust will shake off and I'll 
keep on painting. Interesting. So. And, and so you completely avoid dark, moonlit nights and that kind of uh, scenes for, for your paintings? Well, that, that's actually a good point. I don't. Okay. Um, but when I do them, it's usually because the light mm -hmm. in the scene is what caught my eye. So, for example, I will do paintings of rivers in France or the bridges in Paris with the lights at night reflecting in the water. All right. And I will do similar scenes locally of the sunsets over the water. Mm -hmm. So they're dark, but they're not dark. Right. Because right. it's the, always the color and the reflection, yes, and it's, yes. that's what's drawing me. Mm -hmm. It's that energy. You know, color mm -hmm. and light are energy. Right. That's what is appealing to me. That's what I want to communicate to people in my work. Wonderful. And we have examples of your work. So one of the things that we have is a sailing. You like to sail. Oh, yeah. Racing yes. Home. Racing Home. Yeah, that one and is... And did you, did you display it here in this studio? You know, I may have... Wasn't meant as a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. Very good. Very good. So tell and us a little one, bit about the painting. We can actually see it here on the screen. This painting is loosely based on what I see from my studio, which luckily for me is a marina and a, that's protected by a little island. Okay. And so I often see the sailboats coming in at night and the sun setting off to the side and behind the island. And this wasn't literally what I was seeing on a given evening. I often work from my photos and this wasn't that. Okay. This one was literally out of my head because I've seen that so many times and I've painted that so many times. And in this case, I was looking at the, the purples, the oranges. I wanted to do something with complementary colors. I was kind of playing. Okay. And then I need it to tell a story. Mm -hmm. You know, I rarely do a landscape that doesn't have the human element in it somewhere. A path through the woods, uh, a broken down building, a bridge over a river. There's usually something that says that somebody was there that I hope would intrigue people and make them wonder what was going on or make them want to put themselves into the mm -hmm. painting. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I added the sailboats because I love them. Right. Because we sail, because right. that shows up nicely against the light and because it tells the story of you know trying to get back in time before you have to deal with all the match lights and such <laughs> or before you encounter an adventure you didn't plan on yeah well the whole idea of adventure going out into the water and mm -hmm. into a into a different element exactly exactly yes, yes. and i called it racing home because you know there were they were three, on a way. There were three <laughs> boats. I decided there were three boats that worked the composition, so therefore it had to be a race. <laughs> very good, very good. So sometimes you deal with photographs, that you photograph uh, something you've seen. Often um, I do. And do you do use something as simple as a, as, a, as a phone, or do you actually have a nice camera? I, have a, I have a nice camera, and that's okay. what I usually use. Um, but every once in a while, I will force myself to go outside and paint on plein air. Okay, we've that's, had plenty of art artists. That's artists, sort yeah. of the, the thing mm -hmm. that artists like to do. And frankly, I'm not enamored of it mm -hmm. because I, I sunburn. Right. And I am a mosquito magnet. Mm -hmm. And I don't trust myself entirely to recognize poison ivy. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> and that's before you have the people coming over to you and saying, is that chalk? My kid mm -hmm. does that. No, it is not chalk. It is very expensive pastel, and please don't touch it. Right, okay. Um, and, but still, every once in a while, I force myself to do plein air. And the scene of Bluff Point okay. that I brought in to show was one that I did on plein air. Ah, okay. And that, again, was an exercise in forcing myself to get out there and try to see it, the color, the shape, the light, before it changes quickly. Mm -hmm. And the, the planes on the rocks right. were of great interest to me to try to show without just using gray, because I won't use gray or black or white or brown in my paintings, because mm -hmm. they dull them, mm -hmm. um, without using gray or brown to show the sides of the rocks and the shape of the rocks, and to show that, of course, the little itty bitty people across the way on the beach at Bluff Point, because that's the story. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of folks around here know Bluff Point mm -hmm. State Park, and they hike there, and they recognize the little beaches where you can go and have some privacy. Right. And I was across the way looking at that. Oh, interesting. And okay. so that was what I was trying to capture there was that and sense so you of would, openness. And you would sit there in, a, in an afternoon, a morning, the whole several hours, and paint this? 
a couple of hours a and then of... I would get tired of the sun and of being thirsty and of people coming over and commenting and I would take it back to my studio and finish it. I see, okay. Um, but that's not unusual. I do that with most of my work, whether I've started it outside or whether I'm working from my own photographs. I will work for a couple hours very, very intensely mm -hmm. on whatever the painting is, and then I'll put it aside. Okay. And I'll, I have a shelf in my studio where I sort of line them up if I have something else taped to my easel, because I'm usually working on half a dozen different paintings at any point in time. Mm -hmm. And I'll walk by and I'll say, hmm, you know, that that's the wrong color, or that person appears to be walking backwards, or that building's tilted, or, or how about if I made the sky darker? And I'll try different, and what I'll actually do if I don't have time to do it then, mm -hmm. is I'll make myself notes. Oh, okay. And I've got like a little scratch pad that I keep in my studio, and I'll make notes about what I want to fix on different paintings. And then when I have a block of time, I'll go back in and I'll fix them all, and then I'll put them aside again and see if that was the right fix. And so how long does it take you to, to start to finish a, uh, a painting? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Oh, uh, 20 vary? years plus oh. two hours plus <laughs> another couple of weeks plus another hour plus... So yeah. it's all unpredictable. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's the, the 20 years of having practiced it. It's the <laughs> couple of hours of getting it 70 or so percent of the way there so that um, I know if it's actually going to turn into a painting or not. All right. And then there's the going back to it a couple weeks later and maybe working on it for another hour and then uh, going back to it another couple weeks later. Okay. You know, so. Do you ever feel that you have a painting that is sort of like the never ending challenge? I have one of those in my studio right now. Okay. And if I ever get the series done of Prague, you will know I have successfully solved that riddle. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Because yeah. I, I can imagine if you're constantly playing with them, that there's almost like there's no termination date. There's like, it's never uh, finished. Well, the knowing when a painting is done mm -hmm. is a perennial question for artists. Okay, that, all right. That is a challenge. A lot of people will take it too far and they'll make it very tight and very finicky. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty good about not doing that. Mm -hmm. It also helps to have a deadline because I work really well to deadlines. So if I know, for example, that I have a show coming up, right. mm -hmm. I will get them done. All right. You know, and I will get them done a few weeks ahead because my framer needs time to do her thing. Okay. Um, and I've, I've never met a deadline I didn't meet mm -hmm. and like and beat. So that helps me. That's so that's the incentive to get things yeah. accomplished. Okay. Yeah, that's, absolutely. It, that's, it. that's part of your personality. So yeah, I get it. I get it. <laughs> So we also have some lovely paintings on the floor that are um, also a, a number of your pastels, a number of really bright ones. Oh, that one in the hammock people ask me about a lot. And okay. That's, that's the one that was actually on the poster okay. for the exhibit at Sandy's store. Okay. And that's, and that's what we're going to talk about and, a little later. And yes, Sandy's. that was interesting because I sent my graphic designer several different paintings and said, which one do you think we should use for the poster? And she said, that. Mm -hmm. That one, absolutely, because it's just so different. The angle is interesting. It's sort of, it's intriguing. It makes you want to be there. Um, people often ask me who it is. Mm -hmm. um, I did not take that photo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I change colors and I move things around. In this particular case, this was a series of two and I was playing with it to, to put the body as just a big shape in space and then to figure out how to do the hammock around it. Oh, okay. You know, because you don't do that for, again, I'm trying not to be finicky. But yes, I'm just yes. trying to generally show what it mm -hmm. felt like to have this lazy, luxurious afternoon mm -hmm. to just lie there and read, which mm -hmm. doesn't happen very often. Right. And that right. whole notion of the essence of summer relaxation mm -hmm. is what I was trying to capture, mm -hmm. you know, up to and including the colors, which I changed around. Right. You know, right. to make it feel more summery, more, you know, crisp, candy, mm -hmm. relaxing, soothing kinds of colors. Yes. That was very deliberate. And the background is, is vague, also deliberately, because mm -hmm. imagine it wherever you want. Right. Exactly. 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 And I would imagine now, so I am not an artist, um, except as an, as an author. So I am an artist. Though, you are indeed. <laughs> so I am a, uh, so I'm a writer as an artist, but not a painter as an artist. That, in fact, creating the hammock and the... Um, the actual uh, meshing of that hammock 
must, must be something that might have been difficult to even to create. It was a little challenging, but that was the fun of it. Yes. You know, I, I wouldn't want to do the same thing over and over and over. I would mm -hmm. be bored out of my skull. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I just wanted to try something different. I so often do seascapes. Mm -hmm. I so often do cityscapes. Mm. I wanted a different kind of energy, a, a happier, calmer energy, just to try something new. Right, right. So is there a particular time of the year that you prefer? I mean, these are, these are like summery. Is there a particular time of the year that you prefer to actually paint, or it doesn't matter? It doesn't really matter. The, the paintings in this show are deliberately summery because it's a summer, summer exhibit. And so I was asked to bring in summer-related paintings. And I was also asked to bring in paintings that relate to some of my travels, uh, specifically to France. Okay. And there's a, a, a painting we have here to share with everybody mm. that is a bridge in France. And, and this was actually kind of interesting. But let, let me back up a second, because the reason I was asked to bring in some of my France paintings is that a lot of the collectors and residents down in the borough, people who come into the store to buy their jewelry and get repairs done, are world travelers. We should and mention right off that you have an exhibition uh, at... Black Orchid Jewelers, and tell us 119 this. Water Street, Stonington Borough. Okay, and so it's a, 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 a class act jeweler who uh, ha uses all the colors of the rainbow. He does. He and has, in, uh, has uh, clients from uh, who all travel over. all over we the have world. a number of clients who actually have second homes in France. Mm -hmm. um, his specialty, besides uh, designing and repair, is colored gemstones. All right. He loves colored gemstones. I thought... Beth, with such vibrant, bright colors, would be a great, a great thing to bring in for the summer. Okay. Um, we've had a New York artist there on and off for the past two years, but mm -hmm. now since I've retired from my full-time job, I can help my husband full-time, mm -hmm. and I would like to have rotating art exhibits, and Beth's was our first. Right. And um, I just thought her vibrancy and color, I don't know how else to say it, yes. it's just very exciting. I just thought it would be a great summer show. Mm -hmm. And um, as I said, we, his thing is he can get you a diamond if you want a diamond. You just tell him the size, the clarity, all that, the cut. Mm -hmm. He can do it. He thinks diamonds are boring. All righty. He spent I three years. I liked that man. Yeah. <laughs> he spent three years living in Sri Lanka, learning how to mine the stones and um, we have a direct contact and stuff. And he has to say a stone before he buys it for the shop has to sing to him. Mm -hmm. Has to sing to him. Ooh. So that's how he selects his stones. If it's a dead stone, right. you know. And why it. and why that part of the, the world versus any number of other places where you could get jewelry? Um I'm not sure. I oh. think he heard somebody talking about it. Okay. He knew they are known for their mines. By the way, their mines in Sri Lanka, we went, he took me there. It was very interesting. In this country, we think of mines as the cave in the Midwest, right? right? right. Not so. Mm. Um, well, I we, think when we think of mines, we think of even worse. We think of the coal mines. The coal mines. Mm. Right, you know, you're down, down the under, earth looking underground. like dirt. And yes, 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 yes. Totally different in okay. Sri Lanka. You, we were driving along, and our guide said, there's a mine, and we were on flat land. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking. I'm looking for the mountain. <laughs> there is no mountain. And what it is is a pit. It's a gem pit. And they kind of know where, like, rivers had uh, I mean, yeah, they've flown, flown in the but past. I'm thinking birds. Yeah, I've gone yeah. in the past, an uh, uh, old riverbed, huh. and they dig down, and it's very, they shore up the sides, right. and it's, um, it's very muddy going. They have a big straw basket, and they just scoop up the water and the sand and the muck and swirl it around, and they know how to recognize a crystal. Um, so and that's how like they do it. Panning for gold or something. Yeah, I was it just like thinking, like, for gold. just exactly. Yes, how from cool. the and they know <laughs> it <laughs> by the shape of the crystal. It's uh, like a tetrahedron. So oh. it's not a rock. It's not round. Huh. It's it's that shape. How cool. And um, that's how they're mined. And then he learned. He wanted to buy gems, and the biggest um, gem dealer there, Mr. Zam, would not sell him gems until he learned the whole process. Oh, interesting. Okay. So he had to learn how they're mined, how they're cut. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, 
So he wanted him to really appreciate Jake, them. How to do it. So oh, he was there three years and then came back and was selling gemstones to other dealers and then 20 mm. years ago opened up the retail store. Um, this is like his um, fourth career. Okay. <laughs> um, he understands metals. Now a lot of jewelers do not work in, they don't like to work in silver because mm -hmm. they have to charge you the same amount to make a, you know, a sizing up or down as they do for gold because the workmanship, the work going into it is the same. Right. But he started out life as a nuclear pipe welder. Oh. So he understands metals Metal. and he mm -hmm. works in gold, platinum, silver. So he really, you know, understands that and does, um, people bring in all kinds of things. As I've told Beth, Beth's heard the story. Mm -hmm. One of his good customers is um, a little older, and I, I'm not quite sure how she ran over her earring, but she ran <laughs> over her earring and brought with him a car. the good one with the car, okay. dropped back and out, must have fallen off, and she ran over it. And he was able to make the mirror image for her, so she had her earring back. Oh, so, that's uh, quite and interesting. So he gets a lot of people with some unusual things to fix. Is he still going to the same source for his? Yes, he is. We don't. Um, we'd like to get back there, but we have a contact that goes back and forth. So all our gems are bought direct. We do not have a middle, a middle, middle person. Okay. My daughter was in uh, South Africa a few years ago, oh, yeah. and they do a great deal of mining. And she brought back uh, loose stones. Yes. So a lot of people buy loose stones. Um, one of the pictures I brought is a stone that um, someone had brought back 40 years ago from mm -hmm. Brazil. Um, it's the, it's a Pariba tourmaline um, and a customer had it, I don't, um, asked him to create something for him. Mm -hmm. The other thing he does a lot of times, people inherit jewelry, right. they have jewelry they don't want anymore, mm -hmm. he will use their metals. Mm -hmm. and it'll keep the cost down. Right. So on this particular ring, he designed it. They had loose diamonds. They had a, a big 16-carat Pariba tourmaline, a very, very rare mm. tourmaline. Um, someone else brought back a um, chunk of um, emerald, an emerald mm. crystal, and wanted it made into a pendant, and he made it into a pendant. Um, we have a, actually have uh, actual examples pictures. of... Um, yeah of some of the work he's done. So we'll take a, uh, one of the first ones that you were going to show us. Was the Chrysocolla okay. necklace. Okay, yes. So this, this, this necklace has a, it's a very interesting story. Chrysocolla is found, the stone is found in copper mines. And this was found in Arizona. However, it was uh, one of his best friend's mothers had brought it back again about 30, 40, 50 years, I don't know how long, mm -hmm. from Arizona and mm -hmm. had it in her garden. In her garden? It was uncut, okay. just a, a hunk of rock, and she wasn't sure what she had, so she brought it to Mark and asked him to take a look at it, cut it, and could he make her six pendants? And he could keep the rest if he made her six pendants for um, various family members. Right. <laughs> this happens to be gem quality chrysocolla. Um, it was, I, I looked it up because I wanted to know a little more about it, and in ancient times it was said to have been mined in Solomon's Mines in Africa. Mm. It's also mined in Israel, and mm. it is um, the Israeli National Stone. Um, sometimes there's like a picture in it. This particular piece um, he made for the um, Mystic Aquarium's Ocean Commotion. Um, oh their fundraiser. Mm -hmm. It's on a Labradorite necklace and the bale is uh, sterling silver with a pearl. Mm -hmm. um, he had one other piece and I basically said, that's mine. <laughs> <laughs> you, cannot, you cannot make another one for someone else. You're making oh, it for me. I was just and, coveting that. <laughs> yes, and so I, I, I have the only other big piece he made. Um, from this uh, one From this stone. particular stone one that had stone. been sitting in the rain, in the muck, in the dirt. In well, the that's what actually stone. happens. It's a stone. Yes, yes. Right. Right. stones you know, do and, that um, naturally, yes. It's hard to find gem quality chrysocolla. We've found some other pieces. We've kind of been on the hunt because um, a lot of his customers like it. He's mm -hmm. made some rings up. Um, 
it's hard. Uh, a lot of times it's very porous. This is not. Mm -hmm. This is not. But he was, one of the pieces he was making a ring one Saturday and he showed it to some woman and the woman said, oh no, I want it. Tell me when you're finished. Mm -hmm. He finished it Sunday, called her, she came uh -huh. and bought it. So we figured, oh wow, we've got to find more of this. But, and, and I guess um, you don't always know where you're going to get the stones. You don't always know where you're going to get it or once you open it up, what it's like. So we did find some other, uh, another piece somewhere and it looked like it would be good, but once it was opened, mm. it crumbled. Oh, okay. 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 Um, it mm. came, Chrysocolla comes from the Greek, um, it's one, one of the words means gold, and they used to use it when they made, uh, in ancient times, for solder. I don't know how they did it, but they used to use it to help keep other hmm. gold pieces together. Interesting. So it has uh, always been used for jewelry, jewelry making purposes? Uh, actually, not that much. Oh, not okay. Not that much. Okay. I mean, usually, you know, people have turquoise, they have lapis, they have malachite. Um, I don't think that much was known about it. I'll, sometimes you'll see it in bead form. Mm. They'll make bead, but there isn't that much. We haven't found that much actual jewelry made from this because it's hard to find the gem quality. He just got lucky. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. on that one. All right, so. all right. So that's an, that's an interesting story. Yeah. And the, the other things uh, that you wanted to show us? The other thing, um, these are, this is a woman's wedding and engagement ring and her husband's wedding ring. Her husband passed away and she wanted to fuse them together. Oh. And um, her wedding ring had the diamond and I think his ring had the sapphire. So he remade them, put them together. Wow. And he had some extra gold, which he made a pair of opal earrings from the excess gold. But she wanted that after her husband passed away to be able to. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, so you know, yours is the is the shop to go when you've gotten uh, Grandma died and left you a bundle uh, of uh, stuff from uh, who knows where it came from. Exactly. They, so do you do appraisals of things like that? People just show up with. We with don't stuff? do. We don't do appraisals. Okay. okay. You never want to have a jeweler do an appraisal. Okay. You want to go to an independent appraiser, and we have one who is she is in Old Saybrook, mm -hmm. and we send people there because. Conflict Some, of interest? Yes, they could say this is worth X and it's really worth X times 20, mm -hmm. you know, and so you, you don't want to even, you know, get in that trouble. He will say to someone if they've come in, like, is this worth, they'll say, is this worth doing something with? Mm -hmm. And he'll say, oh yeah, that's like a really good stone or really good piece. You want to keep it or eh, don't worry about that. You know, okay. if you want to melt this down to make something else, that's fine. That's not terribly precious. Mm -hmm. Oh, we do get a lot of people have broken crimp necklaces, broken jewelry, and like you said, jewelry they inherited. It's not in style now. Mm -hmm. um, he loves doing that. He loves being creative. We have a couple from New Jersey who came in, and while it may not be my cup of tea, mm -hmm. um, they want him to design their wedding bands, which are going to be octopus tentacles. <laughs> <laughs> with diamonds in, in, in the, you know. So and he's doing that for them. Oh, okay. And they're very happy. And it's not going to smell? <laughs> <laughs> From the sea? He draws, the way he does it, he draws it out. Then he um, creates a wax model. Oh. He has people come in. They try it on. I was there yesterday. A woman came in. She had picked out five, one fairly good-sized stone and then four little stones. He had the wax. She tried it on. She said, hmm. It's a little bigger than I thought it would be. Could we shave it here, shave it there? Mm -hmm. So while she was there, she, he shaved the wax down. She tried it on again. She said, okay, this is what I had in mind. Mm -hmm. And then he'll have, we have wow. somebody who does the casting for us. Mm -hmm. And then he'll set the stones and give, do the finished product. But right. he loves doing that. He loves it when people come in with a challenge. Mm -hmm. He loves it when somebody comes in and says, I've been to three other jewelers and... They can't do anything. What do you mm -hmm. think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he loves the challenge oh, of doing absolutely. it. Oh, absolutely. And he's, absolutely. Very, he's very good at it and because he understands what metals are and how they operate. And a lot of times people have had things repaired. They'll break. Maybe the person who did it didn't use the right solder. You know, you, if it's 14 karat gold or 18 karat, you've got to use 18 karat gold solder. If it's 14 karat, use 14 karat. Mm -hmm. If it's platinum, 
He had somebody bring in a platinum ring that had been fixed, but they used gold solder. Mm -hmm. And it'll hold up for a while, but, but not indefinitely. Not, not indefinitely. Exactly. Are these gemstones things that can last forever? They will. They, they, they will. They've lasted under the ground, under the ground, ground for forever few, you know, and for ever. A million years, a yeah. uh, couple of million years, yes. They are. And um, they're really beautiful. He's very fussy about what he picks, and they have a lot of life. Like best paintings have mm -hmm. a lot of life. Mm -hmm. The stones he picks out have a lot of life. If they don't have life, and he shows them, like, People, sapphires, for example, he loves sapphires. Sapphires come in every color of the rainbow, mm. which I did not realize. The right. yellow, orange, whatever. A lot of people think the darker the sapphire, the more valuable. Mm. Not necessarily. Sometimes a really dark sapphire has been heat treated to make the color darker because oh. it really isn't a high quality sapphire. Mm. Do you also find, uh, like art in general, that there are trends? In other words, things become big, yes. and then uh, for some reason the the public is very fickle, and for it, well, it could not, you know, be for any logical reason, they decide they don't like that. That is true. I mean, Laramar was very hot a while back. I was reading about this is a tanzanite necklace and earring set he made for me. I love tanzanite. Tanzanite is like the newest stone discovered, 1960s. They didn't have tanzanite then. And basically what the article said is stones do come in and out of favor. Right mm. now, tanzanite became very hot. It's actually uh, called zo zoisite. Mm. Uh, but um, it's only found in one part of Tanzania. There's an eight-mile patch of Tanzania, and that is where tanzanite is found. And Tiffany decided instead of calling it blue zoisite, they would call it <laughs> tanzanite after, after the country. Tanzania. And okay. they went on a big marketing uh, push, push to, to get it out there. And it the country is right of Tanzania. up there. So Tiffany. Oh, Tiffany. Tiffany. <laughs> oh. Tiffany. So basically, sapphires of the color gemstones, sapphires are the most popular. Mm -hmm. Tanzanite's right up there, right and now. And, right, and but then, not always. Not always. Then what happened is I, 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 a lot of um, poachers, I guess, oh. were getting and flooding the market. Mm -hmm. It brought the cost down. They got that under control again, and, and, and right now it's good. I was in Africa in, in the mid-'80s, and I wanted a Tanzanite, and I am so sorry I didn't <laughs> buy one. In the mid-'80s, they were very affordable, less so now. Right. Do you find, or does he find that uh, another thing that impacting precious stones like this could be political instability? Because yeah. most of what you're describing are, are places in like Africa right. or, Brazil, or, or places where Asia, there is not Asia. necessarily always political stability. So, you know, that, that, well, I mean, I know nothing about jewelry. Well, and, and, but, you know, you hear about the black Black diamonds. Black diamonds. They've and you hear about uh, the fact that there's slavery and all kinds of other menacing things that happen about mining it. So, you know, things like that must have they some have, impact. They have. I think they've gotten, I know with the Tanzanite, they got it under control. With the diamonds, they got it under control. Rubies. Used to be you couldn't get, ru Burmese rubies are the most highly prized, and for a while you couldn't get them out of my, Myanmar, I believe, is Burma. what Burma, yeah. Yeah, Myanmar. Burma's mm -hmm. um, and you, you could now it's opened up, but it may get a little not so good for a while. But eventually, the government gets it under control. So mm -hmm. right now, it's in their best interest, of yeah, course. It yes, is. yes. That's interesting. Now, I, my father during the war, I may have mentioned this to you. Mm -hmm. My father during the war was in China, Burma, and India, okay. and he brought back lots of rubies. And of course, we didn't think they were worth. We didn't know what they yeah. were. So he gave me rings. I have not one single ring left of the stuff that he what did gave you do me. With it? Well, I, I, <laughs> I <laughs> tear it. Oh my God! I was I was a beach bum, so I used to go in the ocean. It never occurred to me. Well, we didn't know how valuable they were. So we, oh you know, gosh. you go swimming in the ocean. I and I recently lost the last of of one of the rings that he gave me just. Because you know how it, your, your skin right. shrinks, it's cold. Oh, and it's oh, true, yes. And it just That's why I take oh, mine oh, off, Harry. So, <laughs> I thought you were going to say you gave them to your daughters. You lost them in the ocean? I lost them in the ocean, <laughs> all, all of oh, them. Oh, my God. All of them. The only thing I have left of the, uh, of the rubies that he gave me was he had a... Um, a and it's actually it was my he gave it to my mother and she passed and that's how I got it, but uh, like for loose uh, face powder, 
and it had a, um, it had a, um, and I, I, I assume it's silver that's the, the case, and all over the picture of India are little uh, stones. Oh, wow. So one of these days I'll bring have to it bring in, it into the shop. I, think, no, I gave it to one of my daughters, he, he can, and, uh, oh, yeah. and, and that's the only thing uh, of jewelry that we have left of the stuff it that It could be got. quite valuable. It sounds very unusual. Yeah, yeah it's, it's the, only, the piece. only piece that we have that, that was, and the only reason that we have it is because my mother had it, and since when she passed that we went through. And she didn't go swimming. And she, didn't. <laughs> she didn't go swimming, taking her powder thing with her. She didn't go to the beach with it. But uh, so that's, you know, that's a kind of, a, and, and you, wow. you say that as Silver part of the world. Compact. Because, and my father used to talk about that, is that it was, they're there in the war, and of course, when they were there was British India. Right. Mm -hmm. So Ceylon, which became Sri, Sri Lanka. Lanka, and all of India, and Pakistan, and, and Bangladesh, they were all part of the same place. They were all British India. So you were, it wasn't that hard to go from place to place, and American GIs picked up uh, all and kinds it, of stuff. So when, when we were over there, we went to the, Sri Lanka, we went to the, the factory, and I'm sorry I didn't bring a picture of that, because it's like, uh, they're just trays and trays of gems. They look like M&Ms. They look mm. like colored M&Ms. <laughs> I mean, this whole thing would just be trays with hundreds in it. And it's like, it was very Ooh. dazzling. You know, <laughs> we don't have nearly that many. But um, that's, that's what they're known for. Tourmaline is another big stone over sure. in Sri Lanka. And, um, you know, they, again, come in different colors. Pink, green. I personally love a watermelon tourmaline, which is a combination pink and green in the same stone. And that's mm -hmm. sort of rare. We have a couple of those. And this is actually just physically mined. When you're picking them yeah. up, you're picking up with the color that actually you're, you're came from the You're picking up the, the crystal. It's hard, you, as I said, it's a tetrahedron shape. Oh, well, the crystals are different. They're long and narrow. You, you, you would know if you picked up a crystal. Okay. And then, um, you know, there are different qualities. Like, like with diamonds, they're graded for clarity and stuff like that. Um, and some of the lesser quality they may just leave as a crystal because it's, it's just, it's pretty that way. The mm -hmm. other, if it's very, very clear, they'll cut it and make gemstones for rings and other not earrings and other pieces of jewelry. When they, when they, when you buy it from a foreign country like that, is it uh, graded a, and in that country or do you then bring it they, back? They have, um, they have a grading system. If we, it, it's not like, well, GIA and e, I think it's EGS is for diamonds, but um, if somebody asked, we would have it individually graded here. Mm -hmm. But it goes by the price. And if he knows quality very well and stones mm -hmm. very well, so he can tell, if somebody says, you know, this is a high quality whatever and he sees all inclusions, it's like, yeah, no, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're, that's not, and whatever. But the the dealer that we have is, they, they go back a long time. Mm -hmm. And um, in the gem trade, there's a lot of trust and a lot of time. Sometimes what happens, um, I found this different, um, we can get some, if somebody says, we want like a 10 carat um, Pariba tourmaline, and we don't, we don't keep all kinds of things in the shop, so we will call our dealer. He, if he has it, mm -hmm. He'll give it to us on the 30-day, what's called on memo. He'll give it to us for 30 days. We can show it to a customer to see, is this what you had in mind? Um, and if not, okay. Uh, sometimes the dealer has to get it from someone else he knows. Okay. But we have very good contacts, both for diamonds, which we don't do a lot in diamonds. But right. again, if somebody wanted a diamond and they said, I want like a one carat VS uh, pear-shaped, we call the, the, with this one particular supplier we know, and he will send four or five out. No charge to us. Mm -hmm. We show them, and they, there's a lot of trust going on in mm. the in the jewelry business. And if you don't have that, you're just not going to be able to do anything. To Is your truthful. husband interested in actually training someone to be the the next owner? I mean, it's because it's a definitely been a, not something you go to college I with know. and learn. No, actually, he has a lot of people coming to him. <laughs> he doesn't have a lot of patience for teaching right now, <laughs> although he has talked to a friend about starting a school because so many people want, want to do it. Right. When he went, he went to actually, starting out, his first career was that. Then he did furniture, refinishing, wood carving, and all that. 
But then he did go to jewelry making school, but because of his background in, um, in uh, metals, mm -hmm. I think they let him out halfway through the course. They gave him his certificate. They said, we can't teach you anymore. Mm -hmm. And his first thing, which I, you probably can't see, was he saw a little mouse run across the floor and he carved a mouse and did a, an addition of 50 rings in 18 karat gold, oh. <laughs> which have sold out. Oh. And then he destroyed the mold. Oh. And um, so there was one woman who lost hers. And he said, I can't make it up in 18, but I'll take mine and I'll make a mold out of mine, and he made up another one oh, for her. Oh, interesting, interesting. But anyway, so he did have that. He went to school for, there is a school in Florida. Hmm. Um, that teaches uh, jewelry making. It, uh, with, with the precious stones. And, and that, all that, metal, right. how to do metals, how mm. to set stones, right. Because I would think, you know, some people study stones, like geologists, yeah. you know, study stones so they really know it, they probably know some clarity, but to become a jeweler, is and, a but much you different to, right it, it that is but you still have to go he had a woman who thought she had a um a huge um very very clear um i don't know if it was a ruby or terminal whatever she thought she had it would have been worth like a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars it was sitting in her jewelry case he looked at it he thought it was good but he wasn't sure he wasn't a hundred percent if he's not a hundred percent he'll never say that and so we took it down to our appraiser, and she said, it, it's, it's not what she thinks it is. It's not mm. what they told her, you know, she had. Now, I don't know if she, somebody bought it for her and told her that, or if she bought it, whatever, but it, it wasn't the valuable stone. It was still worth a, probably about $15,000. Well, yes, yes, but, so exactly, it's not, it's not big difference, yes, It's not yes. a piece of junk. Yes, yes, yes. But it, yeah. it wasn't, wasn't the wasn't, other. It wasn't what she thought it would be. Yeah. So mm. how, how did, is, outside of the school in Florida, it, 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 how does one become a, a creative jeweler? Uh, being an apprentice for somebody? You know, I don't. You know, I mean, like there are start, young people. I, there is, you know, who are. I know a long, a long time ago they had guilds. Yes, of course, medieval at times. Medieval sure, times they had course. guilds, and that's how people learned. Um, I don't know. He just, he's very good. He can fix anything. He's always mm -hmm. been good with his hands. He can figure it out. I mean, as I said, he would. The door to our house, he carved mm. the door. So he just has an eye. Um, he took some art courses in school. Some people have a natural talent. I think he has Just, a natural talent yes, that yes. way. Um, I don't. I am an <laughs> art appreciator. I <laughs> love Beth's art. I love art. I did the Mystic Art Show this weekend. I've been doing it for 25 years with a friend of mine. And I think I have a good eye for art. Mm -hmm. And that's th something, as I said, we're trying to do in the shop. We have previously had a, um, a New York artist for um, you know, a little over a year, and we sold some pieces, but I want to do rotating shows. So as I said, Beth's was our first. And we inspired by the guinea pig. <laughs> That's right, and then it'll be inspired by jewelry. Jewelry. Would you? Yes. But we'll, it's, 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 it's together, it's all, it's all art. Yes, it is. I mean, he has some of his signature pieces. He carves the wax, that's art. Mm -hmm. Picking the right stone is, you have to have an eye, that's art. Arranging it a certain way. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's absolutely. all art. It, it's actually in his family. His older brother should have probably gone to art school. He didn't, but they all have like an artistic bent. So yes, not yes. sure where that came from with his parents, lovely people, but neither <laughs> one was artistic. <laughs> but the kids uh, ended up um, having some kind of talent. Yes. Do we have some other uh, photos of some of your other arts? Uh, the, I mean, not the art, but actually the jewelry. Mm -hmm. the, there was that big blue that, ring. That, yeah, it's, oh, oh, here we go. This is interesting. This is the Pariva Tourmaline that from um, South America with the diamonds on the side. Mm -hmm. So he created that, made that. The person wanted a, you know, like a, a heftier ring. No kidding. This <laughs> ring I included because if you see the little bumps on the bottom, the two little round things, um, yes. He calls those speed bumps. He doesn't <laughs> believe in ring guards. So if oh. a person has like big knuckles, rather than do a ring guard which can catch on things, he puts in what he calls speed bumps. So it gets over the knuckle and it keeps the ring from twirling around. Oh, okay. So he will, he will do that. Okay. Um, that, Interesting. That's 16 carats. Oh, cool that's idea. a quite a good size ring. You're not kidding, it's yes. For a big, for, and that, is, that was designed for a man. 
Actually, I think not. I oh, think for, not. for a woman, no, okay. A woman. a woman with big hands. A woman with big hands. All right. That's, that's a good use of diamonds. And yes, then, just as an accent. Just <laughs> as an accent, right. And this was a piece of um, emerald, emerald crystal that his customer had brought back from um, uh, South America also. Mm -hmm. um, Brazil, I couldn't think of the country right, right. It's from Brazil. Um, and wanted it made into a pendant. The, the back side it has a lot more gold in it, keeping it in place, but they wanted just to show the, the beauty of the plain crystal. So that was made into a pendant, and he put the penny to show about what size oh, you were looking at. Oh, interesting, to give us proportionality, oh. yes. Interesting, interesting. Wow. So when you get these th stones from, obviously most of the, there's very there's few stones that you actually mine here in this country that people there use? There are, actually there are we, we ended up bringing some, a, a friend of his was out at the gem show, Tucson, I think it's in February, they have the mm -hmm. big jewelry gem show. And the man who does the casting for us was out there and they found um, uh, star garnets, oh, which okay. are only mined in Idaho in this country. I see. Oh. Brought back, so you know what star rubies are? Where there's literally that there's star, star pattern. There's in the a star pattern, but these are... Um, garnets? Garnets. What oh. color are they? Is that the, the bluish green? No, uh, they're um, like a reddish, they're, brownish oh, more, red. They're usually oh. like a dark red, right? Yeah, oh, like I a dark see. red. Okay. So we, we told them, sure, bring some of those back for us. Um, what I want to do, and I'm sure that's probably not great quality, but Arkansas has diamond mines. Really? And you can go down, and it's like panning for gold. Mm -hmm. You pay, I think, <laughs> I don't know, an entrance fee, and they fish give you, the, yeah, you go fish for diamonds. Um, Maine had a lot of tourmalines, Ooh. and they're, I think they don't have too many mines left because they pretty much cleaned them out, but Maine tourmaline and, um, and in South America, too, they have tourmalines. And, Sri Lanka. The only, when I, I was trying to do some research, I don't remember everything I've read. I'm trying to <laughs> learn more as I spend more time in the shop. But um, basically, a lot of countries have a lot of the different stones, except Tanzanite. Tanzanite is only in that eight square mile. And of Tanzania. In Tanzania. Right. But, right. So you'll find, and a lot of the stones in the, this country. Um, the chrysocolla was from Arizona, but it's mined mm. in Africa and Israel mm -hmm. and in some other western states. Because, um, I mean, we had, of course, we had gold, we and had then gold. we exhausted, I yeah. think, probably most of the gold in this. We had silver. We mm -hmm. had silver mines. And turquoise. again, we most of... Red turquoise. Oh, still turquoise out west. Okay. And they're very much... that. Um, that's my birthstone. That's December. It's the old December birthstone. Now mm. I think they say blue zircon, but turquoise will always be the <laughs> December the birthstone thing. for me. And um, people who are very knowledgeable on turquoise can tell by looking what mine it's from. Really? Yeah. Wow. The different colors, different matrixes. Um, you know, very, it's very interesting, along with opals. Um, Ooh, we have, my birthstone. Um, <laughs> that's your birthstone? We oh, have a yeah. friend whose father is an opal miner in Australia. <gasps> oh, okay. So, okay. so we can, you know, we, oh, now we, we're talking. we, we go to him for <laughs> Let's opals. Let's sell some paintings. I need some opal yeah. jewelry. <laughs> yeah, and uh, he has all kinds of opals. You know, it's fascinating how different stones become prevalent in a specific yeah. place. Turns out in the, in the 19th and 20th century, they become countries. But I mean, it's just really interesting. And it's uh, obviously not in places that are easy to... Not easy to get to. E and to find. <laughs> it, you know, I, I can imagine when you know they went with a Geiger counters or whatever it is, they went looking for stuff. How did he even know to look for this stuff? I mean, where... They I just think people sort of find them by... Just by, by accident? chance, by accident. I, I really don't know how they found tanzanite. I, what I read did not tell me that, other than it was discovered there. Mm -hmm. um, and I know in Sri Lanka, they look for where the riverbeds ran before. They may be buried mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and people who know kind of have a, you, you take a chance, mm -hmm. you know, but um, you start digging, you may not. You may not reach what you want. When I was over in Sri Lanka, I remember seeing an aquamarine necklace. It wasn't gem quality, but it was beautiful. I wanted to get it, and mm -hmm. I was talking to the man who was selling it, and he said he had bought a piece of land because he thought it was going to be good for aquamarines mining them. Mm -hmm. It was not. This right. is what he got. You know, so it's 
Because you, you think with the, uh, in, with the sophistication now of satellites being able to uh, really see into it, because I know that the uh, National Hurricane Center and, and some other kinds of the geological service um, is involved in, you know, really putting satellites to so. go and di and to see into the ground, starting out for military purposes, yeah, of course. Yeah. But for you know, the national, the, the, uh, the geological service right. and other kinds of government agencies, who want to keep track of stuff and and also mining rights. Yeah. Um, I lived in Colorado, for example, and I own land in the mountains. I owned the top of the land, but I never owned the mineral rights. Oh. That that's just, when you say the top the top digging down some or just the, the ground. surface. Well, you know maybe because you I, I could ha I needed to drop a well. Yeah. So no, I could have it to a certain extent, but then beyond that, it was never I oh. never had mineral right. And that goes back, you know, to when Colorado was a territory and mm -hmm. some kind of rules they made, and who knows what kind of graft and corruption creates such a system where a mining <laughs> company can own. The underneath right. where you Under are, your house, you know, yeah. some of the, the stuff that went on with the Native Americans and the things that they found, especially certainly in the Southwest, where they owned only the top, right, and they didn't mm -hmm. own the bottom, and so mining companies came and cheated them and did all kinds of stuff. So out west, there's that uh, kind of crazy set of rules, and and that's why I was asking about regulations. Even in our own country, we have a pretty crazy yeah. storyline about how things got to be what they were. And almost always it has to do with money and paying off people. Yeah, well, and all and I'm sure that's true in Africa and Australia. Oh, I'm sure it's absolutely <laughs> true over in those countries, about, even more, but, more so than here. So that we're trying to get much better at, yeah. at seeing things. I mean, it's, it's helped archaeologists and, and paleontologists and all kinds of stuff like that, being able to see... Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be that far up, you know, maybe 20 miles up, 20 miles up uh, with satellites to get to penetrate in terms of just cameras into the I surface wonder, of the I ground. don't know. I don't have an answer to that, but that's a really interesting question because they can, you're right, they can see all kinds of other Absolutely. things. Absolutely. They're know? trying to use it with volcanoes and all kinds yeah. of, that's why the hurricane and all the me meteorological societies are interested in this to see if they can figure out, um, to to, to go down into the surface, not to the core of the earth where there might be a volcano, but to kind of figure out what's going on below the surface to give more information for, for mm -hmm. scientific purposes. So why not for... Why not for gemstones? For, I yes, know. exactly. Because for all you know, we have all kinds of... You know, kinds we have lots here. and lots of fossils and, you know, dinosaurs lived here and we had all mm -hmm. kinds of current things that happened millions and millions of years. Because that's probably, you know, what creates all kinds yeah. of stones, right? I mean, yeah, that's what diamonds are all about. And pressure. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, so, so why not? They do that with paintings. Oh, when yes, I, they look with x-rays. When x -rays. I worked in an art museum, yes. they use a special x-ray technology to see the underneath Enjoy, layer. Yeah. And that helps them uh, when they have to do restoration work. Mm -hmm. And it also helps them to verify the authenticity of something. If certain artists were known to do sketches first, or certain artists were known to paint over old canvases, and there's some another painting underneath the one that's on the surface. Always amazed me that they could figure that out. Yeah, and that's I, you know I, that's just nice scientific, and, and right. much, mm -hmm. much of it starts out as for military uses, and yeah. then mm -hmm. expands for medical reasons, sure. and then right. of course beyond that, yeah. it's uh, it's yeah. it's that kind of thing. And and I think we have there's um, even though the maybe the particular stone comes and goes in terms of the fickleness mm -hmm. of the public, the idea of stones. Uh, oh. is, is very important. Now, I'm a writer, so I write about, I don't know anything about stones, but I write about the currency of diamonds because oh. I write mysteries. So that um, we know that uncut diamonds are a commodity that is traded and has yeah. been traded for yeah. forever, forever to buy things. And so, and it's a lot easier to internationally travel with a bunch of uncut diamonds than two or three or five or 10 or 50 million dollars. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the kind of playing that I like to do. And, and one of the big centers for diamonds uh, is, is Tell places, Israel, is Israel, of and course. And Amsterdam. And Antwerp. Antwerp. Antwerp, Belgium is, was for 300 years, the Hasidic community, yeah who came to, to that part of Europe were traders in, in diamonds. You, you say, Israel, this is interesting. Years ago, I don't know if you remember the friendship force that Carter started? No. President Carter? 
-hmm. You had to agree to get a host family and you had to pay $250 and agree to go anywhere in the world they were going to send you as like this ambassador for two weeks. I paid my $250. I got my friend <laughs> to agree to be a host and they sent us to Israel and I stayed with a family that owned a diamond cutting factory, which was very interesting. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And if you go, it, the retail meant, center of yeah. the diamond market in this country is 47th Street in Manhattan. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I have, in my mystery novels, I have one of those uh, merchants murdered on the streets of oh, 47th wow. Street, which was actually based on a true story, that there was a diamond yeah. merchant who was murdered. And, and what happens, I mean, I just came from the congestion in New York City. What happens is that you're so focused on getting across the street that you literally would not even even know that somebody Don't was see. killed right unless he to fell you. on top of you. Really? So yeah, because the streets are congested and the people are this completely is like lower. Oh no, Forty Seventh Street is mid Manhattan. Oh, 40, oh really? Yeah. Yes, it's mid, mid just Manhattan, west of Grand Central. I thought yes. she said lower part Forty Seventh. Yes, no, I know. Where so yes, is. so that so anyway, so my Anastasia Goodman novels. Uh -huh. uh, deal in the in the, in the world of uh, of diamonds. diamonds, having that as an exchange. They're, they're interesting. What I find amazing is they can put a number on the side of a diamond. Wow! So, really? Yeah, some of the newer cuts <laughs> to keep you know. to keep track of them. Yeah. Yes, can I can imagine like an inventory that. Number yeah, they can inventory unique. it. Yeah, wow. I I don't very teeny, but yeah. And, the, and one of the things that, so I do a little bit of researching in the, uh, the, the mystery and the crime involved rather than yeah. the value of the stuff. And, uh, and one of the things that has been occurring on 47th Street is, again, one, at one time it was completely dominated by not only Jews, uh, some Israelis, but American Jews, uh, but also the Hasidic community. Yeah. Today, it's actually, there's a lot of Chinese and, and Indian oh, really? diamond yeah. merchants out there on 47th Street. I did not know that. Yeah, I still think so that, you know, that's kind of an interesting because they, somebody taught them and, you know, you just have to do is rent a booth and you're in business. Yeah, well, they have various jewelry store, um, uh, what's the word I want? Not fairs. Meetings around the world, like Hong Kong is a big center. Mm -hmm. They'll have a jewelry market. As I mentioned, Tucson is another big right. one. Um, so we've so. spread our discussions uh, yeah. around the world, yeah. and so we want to make sure that everybody knows what's the dates for the show. The dates for the show is ongoing now until September 10th. So okay, and they can come, come and see and Beth's, Beth's beautiful work. paintings and see some incredible design work by a Mark um, Fishbone, Mark, creative artist. Yes, absolutely. For for so it's a combination of jewels. jewels. And beautiful, it's, vibrant paintings. How could you go wrong? Absolutely. Jewels and, and it's art. Colors and creativity. Exactly. Like? And the address is? <laughs> 119 Water Street, Stonington Borough. Right. Not nearby. So when you're out there going to Noah's or just uh, floating around. And open every day but Monday. Uh, every, and what's your hours? Uh, it's a, probably from about 11 to 5, 6. Seven. Uh, if people are coming ish. in, ish. <laughs> people are coming in, and then Sunday is uh, twelve to four. But we probably don't get out until after five. Okay. Again, if people are in the store, if people are admiring the jewelry or the art, we don't kick them out. We don't kick them we out. We don't close the door. We don't close we, the door. We, we don't say liquor. we're well, whatever. We just <laughs> we stay. So it's I want to thank Beth. There. I want to thank Sandy for thank coming you for our way. Us. Thank uh, you for and it's me. a nice combo that we did. So that's wonderful. So we Thank want you. the customers to come on out, take a look. Uh, art is beautiful. Jewelry is forever. Isn't that the way diamonds yes. are forever? <laughs> Jewelry is forever. So it's not only for ladies, gentlemen. It's, uh, it's not quite the holidays, but, you know, we want to give an early, early look. So I want to thank everybody for coming by. There's Thank a great you, art Harry. show coming. So this is Harriet Grayson, your host and producer of Community Culture Showcase. And join us next time when we'll have some other wonderful artists.